Welcome to our monthly feed yard webinar series that we've been hosting at the University of Nebraska. Uh, if you're watching this online, uh, please feel free to, to visit the web address listed there and, and provide feedback and comments to us so we know uh, how we're doing. You can access that at any time after watching the, uh, the program today. Uh, we've had a series of, of five different topics. Um, and really, I think timely topics, and, and this is the last in our scheduled series of, of topics for this 2018 spring summer time frame. We're in the midst of planning future webinars for starting up again in the fall. So to round out our, our topics for this early part of 2018, very excited to introduce uh, Dr. Terry Arthur. Uh, He's a, a scientist at the USDA Meat Animal Research Center and heard him talk on, on this topic a couple of times and think they're doing some really exciting, interesting things related to antimicrobial resistance. And I know producers hear about that a lot, but I think it's important to have at least a, a rudimentary understanding of what that issue is and what does it really mean. And so look forward to him putting that in context for us because I know he's got that in in his title. So, Terry, appreciate your time today and look forward to your comments. Thank you, Galen. So, yeah, Galen asked to speak a little bit about animal color resistance and really um, its effects and impacts on feedlot uh, beef cattle producers. And so that's that's the focus will be essentially on that. There'll be a few things uh, in generalities, but mostly we're going to be talking about uh, antimicrobial resistance and the issues that, that it presents for beef cattle in the feedlot setting. And so the idea is the need for context. And part of the title is, is antibiotic, antimicrobial resistance, is it everywhere? And so, and the bottom line is it is everywhere. Where there's bacteria, there's gonna be antimicrobial resistance, also known as antibiotic resistance. We use antimicrobial. And so you need to have a context so you can understand uh, if somebody goes out and you're trying to interpret the results of some of these uh, studies they do, is it, what does that finding of resistance mean? Okay, so antimicrobial resistance in general, global health crisis, human health, this is gonna be one of the big issues for human health for years to come. Um, we've had this period of, of years where we've been able to use antibiotics, antimicrobials to improve human health and reduce disease. We're finding resistance to those drugs now and our rate of discovery of new drugs has slowed dramatically. Very few new drugs are coming out. So this all started around 1940s. Uh, in the 1940s, we started uh, we identified we could use uh, antibiotics like penicillin to treat disease and that progressed over time to where we are today. And at the same time, as you can see on the left side of that figure, is that resistance was identified to those, to those drugs and even resistance was found prior to using those drugs once they went back to look at historical bacterial databases and found out that there was actually resistance before that. And so antibiotic production goes hand in hand with antibiotic resistance. And so um, that really needs to be in the concept uh, and the discussions when people are talking about what is resistance and what is, the, what is the meaning of it. So in looking at how human health is dealing with antibiotic resistance, the, one of the main points is where is it coming from? What is the driver of uh, human health uh, detrimental impacts due to antimicrobial resistance? And one of those, issues has been the amount of antibiotics used in, in animal production, agricultural uh, animal production, is a large amount. 80% of all antibiotics are used on, on animals. And you can see this is one of the um, kind of the propaganda that's out there that says on factory farm animals, you can see there's a slant to this. But in general, that it is true that a majority of antibiotics are used in animals, and that can you can bring that number down from 80% if you remove some things that aren't really human health antibiotics. But let's just, for the sake of the argument, say that animals are using much more antibiotics than humans as just a quantity. But the question is, does use equal resistance? Our, our issue of human health, the concern is resistance. What has been used right now is that 
there's a large amount of antibiotics being used. So we need to determine, does use equal resistance and, and what are those issues? So here at the U U.S. Meat Animal Research Center, we have a group that works on antimicrobial resistance. And our main goal is to determine what is the contribution of antimicrobial use in food animals to compromised human health outcomes due to resistance. It's a big, complicated mission. But the idea is, if we're focused on resistance, we're not worried really about um, just simply use. We want to know, is antimicrobial use in animals affecting human health? And, and try to gauge how, what is the impact of that? What's the risk um, of using those antibiotics? And not simply to go out and determine, is there resistance in an environment? Because you're going to find resistance in an environment. And that's the bottom line of this talk, is that you will find resistance when you go out there. What kind of resist resistance and in what organism is really the question. And would you find that in another environment other than an agricultural environment? And then after we uh, address that question, we, we will go on to identify what can we do to reduce the resistance issues. But I'm not going to talk about that today. It's just, that's a separate part of our mission. So when you're looking at antibiotic resistance, um, you have to, you see these studies all the time, you have to take into account that resistance is in all these environments. And so this is a one that came out in the popular press is an Amazon tribe. They don't, haven't been exposed to modern medicine, hadn't seen any antibiotics in their system, antimicrobials but yet they had resistant organisms associated with them. A cave uh, that had been isolated from, from human population, it's four million, four million year old cave, lots of resistance. If you look at, at a figure from that particular publication, these, uh, this, this figure shows that, oh, here's all these drugs that these antimicrobial, that these bacteria were resistant to, and they go through different classes, very significant classes of antimicrobials, for human health, and they found resistance to these particular drugs in these organisms in this very isolated cave. And so the question is, what, um, where does this all come from, and, and are you taking that into account that even in these uncontacted environments, you're gonna find resistance? And so in general, you see this kind of, this figure of in the, in the environments that we deal with day in, day out, where is this resistance coming from? Antimicrobials are used. In human medicine, they're given to people, and then you see that they are uh, resistance can go into hospital settings, wastewater treatment plants, and into different parts of the environment. Antimicrobials are used in veterinary medicine, both for companion animals and food animals, and that can either have antimicrobial resistance in food products um, or in manure and in the environment and runoff. And then it's also there is some use in treatment. But the key is what is this antimicrobial use in these different populations? How is that all affecting resistance in human health? And what's left out of that conversation is that the majority of antimicrobials that we use today were identified from actual just generic soil microorganisms that have been here for millions of years. Since bacteria have been around, resistance has been associated with them. And that's, so if we look at all the antibiotics or the majority of the antibiotics that are used today in the top, uh, the top table here, those are all the antibiotics that came just from bacteria in natural environments, usually from soils. And so they're called natural products. They're found, these antibiotics are found just in, in normal environments. They're not synthesized. Down below, you can see a table that has synthetic antibiotics, those that we have de uh, derived uh, through chemistry and so, and so on. But on the top, you see, okay, these are natural products. They're natural environments. And Therefore, resistance is going to be found to those, again, in natural environments. And so the problem with resistance is you get a large umbrella called resistance that covers all of these drugs. And so uh, on the left side, this is, all these drugs here are the World Health Organization list, list from, if you go from right to left, uh, the right side is the most important, critically important to human medicine, and on left, the tetracyclines are the least critical to human medicine. But they're all under the same antibiotic resistance umbrella. When somebody says, oh, we found resistance, they could be saying we found resistance to tetracyclines, which you're gonna find in most, if not all environments, or we found something uh, to the third generation cephalosporins, which are very important to human medicine. And then you go, go through the list. And so when we put those all in one blanket uh, or on, under one umbrella, it becomes very confusing as to what's important and what's not. 
The second step of that is, is it in a bacteria that's a pathogen going to cause human health issues, or is it in something, a commensal organism, that's not going to cause issues, but we use it for an, as an indicator of, of just resistance. It's easy to measure. We can go out there. It's harder to find certain pathogens. So on the right side here, you have very serious resistances, possibly in a pathogen, very detrimental. On the left side, you can have resistance in a commensal organism. Really, it's not going to cause any human health issues, but it's an indicator. But is it accurate of really the big picture? So the CDC puts out what their threats are and uh, to human health. And there's very few, I've highlighted a few here, that are actually could potentially come from amicable use in animal agriculture. Um, and so it's really important to really focus on those. Just wanted to highlight that. But what I want to talk about today is context. What is context? So when we have resistance, I've just told you we're going to find it in almost all environments. But when you do a study, those studies have to compare similar environments to see is that antibiotic use in animal agriculture? If you uh, looked at a similar environment, would you see that same resistance? Also compare uh, groups or environments with and without an antimicrobial treatment. And then if possible, also have a risk benefit. If you're going to have some resistance come from a use of an antimicrobial, what is the benefit uh, for that? And so um, the first part of context that I'm going to talk about is we went out and looked at different environments. We took a municipal wastewater treatment plant discharge, so this is what has been treated and released in the environment, and compared that to what's in a livestock environment, so either cattle or swine, and then also a low impact environment like uh, prairie soil or um, a, a urban pond setting. And what we found is we're looking, these numbers indicate the number of antimicrobial resistance genes that were unique to those particular environments, and we found much more that's being discharged from a municipal wastewater, or many, these are actually several municipal wastewater treatment plants. We had three groups for each of these circles here. And so the idea behind that is, uh, if you had gone out and sat, say you knew this particular cattle environment, they were using cert certain antibiotics uh, to raise those animals, and you found these resistance genes, what does that mean? Well, you have to put that in the context of these are the genes that are being released every day from municipal wastewater treatment plant considered to be safe and, uh, uh, for discharge to, to uh, either streams or the biosolids are discharged to fields or, or landfills. And so we have to have something to compare when we go out to an animal agriculture environment and say, really, this is the impact that we're having here. And so from this particular study, we see many more genes, antimicrobial resistance genes coming from municipal wastewater treatment plant discharge. Especially uh, if we look at severe genes. So these are genes for the, some of these last line of defense uh, antibiotics, these carbapenemase. We find many more in municipal uh, discharge than we do in the swine or cattle environment. We even find some in the low impact environment. And as I said, a lot of antibiotic resistance comes from soil bacteria. So just having soil bacteria, you can find some of these. So again, it's all about how you're running the comparison. What is the context that you're looking at resistance? And so in that study, uh, we looked at cattle, municipal, and swine in different environments and some different resistant E. coli. This is that third generation cephalosporin E. coli. That's very uh, severe uh, resistance for human health. And we find similar rates in the cattle, swine, and municipal environments. But I highlighted in green the, the fact that we find these resistant organisms in low impact areas. So this is in, um, in the prairie soils, we found these things. So these are soils that aren't receiving antibiotic uh, selection pressure. They're not receiving manures. Uh, and we find these resistances. And when we looked at that, one of the things we thought was, so these are the levels down here in this figure, the levels of those bacteria. We see about a thousand organisms per gram of, of material in the cattle, municipal, and swine environments, but we see very little, very low populations in the, in the native, the low impact areas. And our question was, although we see these resistances here, they're lower than we found in these environments, if we raise that total bacterial population to the levels that we see in these areas that have something like cattle manure, or swine manure, or even municipal biosolids, would we see the same amount of resistance just by growing up this total bacterial population? Would we see the same amount? And we'll talk about that as we go along. 
in a second study, we looked at feeding cattle some chlortetracycline, and this is a common treatment that they do in feedlots. It used to be prior to the veterinary feed directive coming out to prevent bovine respiratory disease. And I just want to touch on a few things about the risk benefit in the context of a uh, question. So if we look at the risk benefit, so in the cattle that received the chlortetracycline uh, treatment, they had very little disease. But if we, the ones that didn't, we had 25% of those animals that needed treatment, they got pneumonia and they needed treatment. And so you have this large increase uh, in illness uh, by not using a CTC feeding, which is just a five day feeding here at the beginning of the trial. And then it went over 120 days. And so right there, you just see, well, we have less animal illness if we were to use a prophylactic treatment but what happens to those 25% that did get that did get pneumonia? They have to be treated with a much more critical antibiotic now, something that is important for human health. They, these cattle received a, a macrolide. Um, the trade name is Zepravo, and that's uh, that form of macrolide is much more important to human health. So again, you have the risk of using chlortetracycline, which its resistance is generally just tetracycline resistance, something not that critical you get better animal health um, than if you have to come back and treat later with something that is more important to human health. In that same study, when we looked at the tetracycline resistance, we see a little bit of an increase over the, in the treated animals right after that feeding period, but essentially goes away by 27 days uh, after the treatment, and there's no difference, no, no difference in resistance in the fecal shedding uh, of these cattle. And same thing with the pen surface samples, the treated and the uh, control, the non-treated animals, there's very little difference in the tet-resistant E. coli between those two samples. But we see a big difference uh, between these are empty pens, so they're not receiving manure. And so we'll talk about that in this nutrient idea. And the last thing I want to touch on just in, a, in a, the study is we had a study of animals that received antibiotics versus animals that did not receive antibiotics. And so in green are those cattle that were raised convention or raised without antibiotics, so never had an antibiotic. And in the red, we had those that were raised with antibiotics, conventional production. And you see very little difference. This was a study led by John Schmidt here at our research center. Very little difference in the treated versus control, but you see a big difference in the seasonal. And this isn't this isn't one group of cattle over time. This is individual groups that came to slaughter. So we sampled them at the same point in their life uh, each time. And you see that this big difference is seasonal rather than between treated and untreated. And again, this leads to what's going on with this outgrowth of these bacteria. And so this led us to what is, the, what is nutrient enrichment doing? Uh, is that providing a bigger uh, cause of antimicrobial resistance than actual antimicrobial selection? It's always been believed that if you give antibiotics, that's going to be your biggest driver. But we, what we're finding is that simply growing the bacteria, like we said in the first study, if you grow these bacteria up, would these come up to the same levels that we see in these animal and, and human uh, environments? In this particular study, very little difference between treated and untreated, but a big difference between no animals and animals, meaning that manure deposition, again, providing nutrients to that environment. And then lastly, as I just said, little difference between treated with no antibiotics, uh, and never had an antibiotic, and the treated animals that were raised conventionally, much less difference than we see in this seasonal difference. Again, is that our, the, our hypothesis that nutrient enrichment, the just adding nutrients, no antibiotics, uh, is playing a bigger role in antimicrobial selection. And this is lost in a lot of the, the talk about antimicrobial resistance. So we went out to an unimpacted area. It's just a space we had here in our research center, just an area of grass had been mowed for years, never had anything done with it. No animals are, are on there. And we just set up plots. And what can we do? We're in those different plots, we're going to add either nothing, we're going to add water, or we're going to add nutrients, sterile nutrients, not, not manure, no bacteria added, no antibiotics, just sterile nutrients. And we set up these plots, we fenced them off so we didn't have any deer or large wildlife come through there. And then we turned them uh, just to keep them mixed every time we'd add whatever treatment, the nothing, the water, or the, uh, or the sterile nutrients. 
And what we see here is if we look at just, this is one type of bacteria, generic enterococci. And the red is when we added nutrients. And we grow that up to about um, a million organisms per gram of soil. And if we didn't add anything, you can see they go to essentially not, not detectable. And that's just a, the generic uh, enterococci is just a, a type of bacteria that we look for. And then we looked at the resistance, the resistant groups in that, or, uh, for that particular organism. So first one is tetracycline resistant. And you see we're at about 100,000 organisms per gram of soil just by adding nutrients. And if we don't add anything or we add water, we don't see that same increase. And then on the bottom, that's erythromycin resistant. That's a macrolide resistant enterococci. So that's a more, uh, more complicated issue because it's a more uh, critically important antimicrobial. And you see we're at about 10,000 organisms per gram of soil. Again, nothing uh, for the water or no treatment. And what is indicated there in the black lines are what we actually found from cattle samples, fecal samples, from the conventional or the non-treated study. And you can see we can exceed the levels we see in those fecal samples simply by adding nutrients to soil that hasn't been impacted by antibiotics or manure. So that's, that was really a big step saying that really if you just add nutrients, you can drive these levels of resistance quite high. Same thing with if you look at another uh, organism. Okay. Well, um, Galen. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so on this slide, you can see that we look at E. coli. It's another indicator of resistance. And we see uh, we don't have quite the same increase over time that we had. Uh, it's a little back and forth, probably due to competition of these bacteria in the soil. So it comes up at first, goes down, and then kind of bounces around a little bit. But there are competitions in these soils, and we were trying to find something that was going to be more conducive to E. coli growth. And we found a little bit as we changed the bacteria growth media over time. You can see at the bottom, we tried a couple different types of sterile nutrient uh, formulations, and we got different growth at that time. And in the bottom figure, you see that the tet resistant E. coli came up to between uh, 100 and 1,000 organisms per gram of soil. Um, but we couldn't get it up quite to the dashed lines, which were what we had seen in the cattle environment. And this, not that the resistance wasn't there, it was just probably we couldn't find the right nutrients to get to that particular, uh, those levels. So if we look at the genes that we found in there, tetracycline resistant genes, so on top is tet, tet A, using some different type of media, so we used either a lactose, a sugar, or some, some different broth media, you can see that we could get the tetracycline resistance genes, both TET A on top or TET B on the bottom, to exceed the levels that we see in conventional or raised without antibiotics uh, fecal samples from, from cattle. So we were able to get those, we just had to change the media a little bit to, to, to grow those populations of E. coli up a little bit better. And then looking at the third generation cephalosporin, this is that resistance that is very critical to human health. We could, this is just prevalence now. Uh, we didn't have enough to get numbers to count uh, on there. We could just find out, was it there or was it not a plus minus in our four plots? And we found that in three of the plots, we could find that very important resistance without using any antibiotics, simply by nutrient addition. And then if we look at the gene for that antibiotic resistance or antimicrobial resistance, that gene comes up following that population. So we can see here's the resistance when we grow the bacteria and we look inside and, and there's that particular gene that's conferring that resistance. Again, simply due to nutrient addition, something like manure addition. So the last kind of data I wanna go through is just what's called metagenomics where we look at the DNA from all the whole sample. So we just take whatever is there, we take all the DNA out of it and we look at all the genes in that particular uh, sample. And you can see on top of that particular figure, there's very little of these colored boxes. And this is just the color indicates uh, blue is you see some of that particular gene and the pink means you see even more. See, so about, uh, you see the, the range here of zero to seven. Um, and so when we didn't add any nutrients or this is the water and the or, uh, environments, 
you see very little of these antimicrobial resistance genes, but when we added the nutrients, you can see we find all of these different uh, antimicrobial resistance genes. They're tetracyclines, uh, macrolides, aminoglycosides, and these are all those natural product antibiotic resistance genes. So those natural product antibiotics, which are made commonly by soil bacteria, we can find these genes simply by growing those bacteria up in those environments. So what's this mean though? How does that compare to a feedlot? So on the top here, the first four slots are uh, when we took our day zero, we didn't add any environments. This is that soil before we added nutrients to it. And the bottom two lanes here are from an empty feedlot pen. These are pens that didn't have, don't have cattle in them. When we sampled them, they had cattle in them prior to, so you can see a few genes there. All of these are from actual feedlot with cattle, feedlot pen surfaces with cattle in them. So you can see a variety of those genes. And this is what we get from the nutrient enrichment. We're starting to see very similar antimicrobial gene uh, profiles to what we see in the actual feedlot surfaces. We're actually getting close to being able to mimic that simply by nutrient addition. And again, the idea here was how much of a role does nutrient addition play in these producing these antibiotic resistances in these, uh, in these environments. And so the conclusion was that the enrichment of the resident antimicrobial resistance uh, population, those bacteria that are in the soils already, um, that's going to have a larger impact than actually uh, antimicrobial use is having, it's principally with these natural products, macrolides, tetracyclines, aminoglycosides, and beta-lactams. Those are those natural product antibiotics. And so when you see this study that says tetracycline resistance was found in the one that I, I comes to mind first was the tetracycline resistance down in the Texas feedlot study, what you're going to find, they, they were really just testing dust. If you test dust, uh, you know, you're going to really find antimicrobial resistance in that, especially tetracycline resistance. And that's, so it really wasn't as big. Of, it got a lot of impact or, or, or in, the, in the press. But when you looked at it in comparison to what the actual uh, conclusions were, it, as far as the antimicrobial resistance part of it, that it was, it was a fairly common resistance that was found in many environments. So just to finish up, one thing I get from a lot of feedlot producers is they say, well, we don't care for this particular study just because the, uh, or not the study, but this, this idea, because this, what this is telling people is that antimicrobial resistance is coming from this manure. And while there is resistance in there, and that's part of the study, the idea, though, is that this is nothing new. We've been putting manure on fields for, as this study shows, 8,000 years, long time. Our resistance, human health resistance issues, has just started in the last 20, 30 years. Uh, and it's really been since our clinical use of, of antimicro antimicrobials is what's really probably driving it. But we've been doing manure for, for, on fields for thousands of years. And even if you look at the populations, U.S. population in the year 1500, we had about 10 million people, but we had about 30 to 60 million bison out there roaming the world producing manure, again, disseminating that across these environments. Today, we have many, many more people, uh, and so we have much more issues with wastewater treatment and biosolids that have to go somewhere, and, but our livestock environment hasn't uh, increased quite as much. So, this is something that's not new as far as manure being used on these fields and in these particular environments, but the idea uh, that its impact having it, for, and we're stocking beef cattle and feedlot uh, production systems particularly, from our studies, they don't seem to be having a large impact on human health. We don't see a lot of difference between using antimicrobials in, in beef cattle production versus not using those. And so there's a lot of people that have been working on this. John Schmitz, another uh, scientist here at our research center and has done a lot of work with us, uh, with me on these particular projects. And then uh, Dr. Zwila, Aga, Miller, Vikram uh, have all been integral in this. And then uh, we have a great technical staff, Frank Greeno, Julie Dyer, and Trent Ehlers was, was also on this uh, particular project. So um, this, we don't really um, have any questions at this time, but if you do uh, have any particular questions, feel free to forward them. We're at the U.S. Meat Animal Research Center, and I know Galen has a slide for feedback. So if you have any feedback on this uh, particular 
topic, please go to the, um, the link and provide the, your evaluation. Thanks, Terry. And as you alluded to, if they uh, if they they can look you up and obviously reach out to you, or if, if they want to go through me, I'll forward on those questions and, and help get them answered. Appreciate you doing this. And um, you know, it seems like it does seem like a complex topic, and uh, we're kind of in the midst of continuing to learn more about it. I just think it's it's interesting that uh, you raised some points that maybe, in my mind, call into question some of the conclusions that if it's, I guess my, my conclusion is that, is it ubiquitous and natural and are we speeding it up or not? Yeah, and I, 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 I think that's the exact question is that there is resistance that is ubiquitous and I think the problem that we see is that there's a little bit of disconnect between what's being considered as resistance in human health. I mean, those are, they're more, interested in those beta-lactams, the third generation cephalosporins. But when it comes back to studies in the, in the agricultural side, it's more of these less critical antimicrobials that you're gonna find. And the reason is, it's just they're easier to find in these environments. And so folks want to use them as an indicator, which I don't think they're great indicators, but the problem that we see is that if you're using something like a TET-resistant indicator, to then make a decision on something like a third generation cephalosporin, they're, the two are somewhat, they're not representative of each other. And so to do these studies um, where you're not looking at antibiotic resistance that's a human health issue and the hopes that it's going to be some kind of an indicator is um, not, in my opinion, particularly fruitful. Yeah, very good. Thanks for doing it today. Thank you, Galen.